This program is brought to you by Abiding Above Ministries. You know, healthy families, they enjoy being together. Staying away from your family and living a very private life is evidence that something's wrong. And so God would have us, as children of God, to desire to be a part of His family. It shouldn't be a work that we do. It should be a desire that we have. You see, we have our vertical relationship with God. That's Godward. I'm a child of God. He lives in me and I'm in Him. But then we have our horizontal relationships that we have with other people. And when there's something between me and God that's not right, it automatically affects all of my horizontal relationships, whether it's in my immediate family or in the family of God. And when there's something between me and my brother and sister in Christ or with my family members at home, it automatically means there's something between me and God. I mean, our vertical relationship and our horizontal relationship are very, very important. There must be unity. There must be harmony in our relationships. The question is this. Do you desire to be with the family of God? Did you find yourself having kindred spirits? Those people that you love to talk with and listen to and be with. Or would you say, no, I feel like a bird on a housetop all alone. Do you desire to be with your family members in Christ? Well, the first thing I want to talk about, and the title of this message is Christian Fellowship. I want to talk about, number one, the reason for participation in the local church. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 25. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. So number one, what's the reason for participation in the local church? Well, it's a command. It says right there in verse 25, it says, not forsaking our own assembling together. In other words, it's a command that we should obey. But because someone is not here every time the doors are open doesn't mean necessarily there's something wrong. Could be, but not necessarily. You have to be careful in this matter of being legalistic in church attendance. But now if there is no desire whatsoever to communicate with other brothers and sisters in Christ, not only on Sunday at the church house, but also during the week in their home or your home or out somewhere in the community, if there's no desire at all, there's a problem. Something's wrong. And so we're not to forsake the gathering of ourselves together. It's a command that we should obey. But another reason for participation in the local church is failure to becomes a habit. Failure to participate in the local church among brothers and sisters in Christ, it becomes a habit. What did it say there in verse 25? It says the manner, and I think some translations, I think it does use the word habit. I'm talking about desire. I'm talking about the fact that if there's no desire to spend time with brothers and sisters in Christ, you've got a problem. And I'm talking about the fact that if we ever start down the road where we do forsake the gathering of the brethren, it easily becomes a habit. It almost becomes a standard in our life. We have to be very careful. But then a third reason for participation in the local church is to be there to encourage and be encouraged. Now, all of us love to be encouraged, but do you know that you and I should encourage one another? Look at uh, Ephesians chapter 4. Look at verse uh, 15 and uh, 16. Paul is talking here, and he says, beginning in verse 15, I break right into this passage here. He says, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what, listen, every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share. What does it do? It causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. And then look at our chapter 5 verses 18 through 19 of Ephesians 5. And do not 
be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And so we see here that as children of God, it is a command that you and I should not forsake the gathering of the brethren. But listen, if you have no desire to be with other believers in Christ, something's wrong. And if you become a person who gets in a habit of not going and you lose the desire, you've really got a bad problem, my friend. We're not to forsake the gathering of the brethren together. That is a command we should obey. Failure to becomes a habit. We need to be here to encourage, to edify, and to exhort one another. Now, second thing I want to talk about is this. What are the benefits of participation in the local church? Turn to Acts chapter 2, and uh, let's look at uh, verses 42 through 47. Now, this is talking about the, the first church. It's formed, it's spreading, and listen to what it says. And they continued steadfastly, notice, in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And what did the Lord do? He added to the church, notice it says, on Sundays only? It says daily, doesn't it? How many days in a week? Seven. You mean they were talking to each other without being in the church house? Yeah. Where did they meet each other? Well, they had Starbucks back in those days. They had nice cafes and patios on their porch. They met each other out in the community. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So this is the picture. The Bible teaches us that we're not to forsake the gathering of the brethren together that we should desire to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ, encouraging one another in song and psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in our hearts to God. It should be what we love. It should be a habit that we're into. Whether you come every time the doors open or not, that's between you and God. But the main thing is this, is to know that these are my brothers and sisters in Christ. The same spirit lives in them that lives in me. And I've got a part in the body of Christ, and there's no way that I can walk in that part and let God use me if I'm separated from them. If I have no desire and I forsake the gathering of the brethren, it can become a habit in my life, and it becomes a new standard, and therefore I I don't even feel conviction anymore. It's the way I am. I'm just kind of haphazard with my church attendance. It's just like a, a family that's dysfunctional. It doesn't work. Every joint is not supplying its part for the edification of the whole. And so the benefits of participation in the local church, you see this all through Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. One of them is this. One benefit of participation in the local church is instruction. Look again at uh, verse 42 in Acts chapter 2. Continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. And so you come, you hear God's Word taught in class. You come and you hear God's Word taught in worship, corporate worship together. And what happens is this, from the Word of God, by the Spirit of God, through the exhortations and teachings of your pastor and your teachers, you mature in the doctrines. You mature in your faith. You become a mature believer. And I believe when you're mature, you desire to be with God's people. To you, it's not a chore. Yes, sometimes it causes you to have to be disciplined with your time and things like that. But more and more, that's what you love. You want to be with other spirit-filled brothers and sisters in Christ. And a benefit of that is you do get instruction. But like you hear me say often, do not be a person who has to be fed all the time. Don't think, well, I'm going to go to church on Sunday. I'm going to get a lesson from my Sunday school teacher and a, a sermon for my pastor, and then that's going to be it for me until next Sunday. That's not right. 
You need to be a self-feeder. We are brothers and sisters in Christ that are walking with God in God's Word, walking in His Spirit, learning on my own, encouraging others throughout the week with what God's showing me, being encouraged by other brothers and sisters in Christ by what He's showing me. It needs to be a harmony this way. And by the way, sprinkle on top with a lesson from my teacher on Sunday and a lesson from my pastor. You ought to be learning far more the other six days of the week. And so a benefit of participation in local church is instruction, but there's also a second benefit, and it's the main emphasis, is fellowship. Now, there are two Greek words to describe fellowship, one of them being koinonia, which is corporate activity, participation with others, association springing from a mutual spirit. When there's genuine koinonia, it's kind of contagious. It is kind of contagious. You know why? It's because it's springing from the same source, the Spirit of God. Nobody can lay claim to it. It's the work of God in the man, in the woman, boy and girl, who walks in the Spirit. And so there is corporate activity, participation with others, an association springing from a mutual spirit. It comes with your human spirit being enmeshed with God's Holy Spirit, mine being a mess with the Spirit of God, and we're together, and there is a koinonia. But then there's also uh, another Greek word, and it's called met, okay, and that is the relationships of Christians to one another. There is a mutual oneness of spirit with one another. You see, we have a mutual spirit with a big S. It's the Holy Spirit of God. You see, Fellowship is more than just being together back in the fellowship hall, which that's good. It's more than that. If we did not have a fellowship hall, we should still be having fellowship with one another. Back in the early church, when you read uh, the whole chapter of Acts, what do you see? They didn't have a fellowship hall. They didn't have a church here, and you open it up and there's all the people. They didn't have that. What did they have? They had a oneness of spirit. They were like-minded, every joint supplying their portion. And so there is real, genuine fellowship. More than being together, but it's more doing together. Look back at um, the Gospel of John. Uh, Look at uh, verses 1 through 5. John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, And without him, nothing was made that was made. In him, listen, was life. And the life was the, notice this word, light of men. And the light shines in the darkness. And what? The darkness did not comprehend it. Now, a person who's not a child of God does not have spiritual life. You see, you can ask most people this. When do you go to heaven? They say, when I die, I'll go to heaven. And if you ask people, tell me this, well, what is eternal life? What is that? Really, what is it? They say, well, that's when I go to heaven. When I die, and I'll go to heaven, and I'll live for him eternally. Most people will tell you that. That's what the definition they'll give of eternal life. But listen, this is the truth. Eternal life is the very life of God in you. God is eternal. He is the life with a capital L. And he came into this world, and it says in John chapter 1, verse 5, the light, talking about eternal life, and also light, who is God, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Have you ever tried to have fellowship with someone that you thought was a believer, and you said, you know, somehow or another, I just can't fellowship with her. I can't fellowship with him. It's just like we just miss. Uh, There's no connection. And, you know, you don't want to think it, but you do think it. I don't think she's saved. I don't think he's saved. You ever thought that? Yeah, you have. You didn't tell anybody that. It's like, I just don't think the light's on in there. It's hard to have fellowship with people when there's no light on, right? Why? They can't comprehend. Look at uh, John chapter 3, verse 19. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness 
rather than light because their deeds were evil. Listen, a natural man, a spiritual man, anybody who has a child of God in him, listen, there can be no koinonia, period. And so if there's no harmony, no unity, no koinonia, no real meaningful, genuine fellowship, if none of that is happening, my friend, something's wrong spiritually. Amen? Sometimes we take it for granted that everybody around us is truly born again. But it's not always the case, and we have to consider that. Why? Because the Bible teaches there is no fellowship between darkness and light. Look at Acts chapter 26. Look at verses 14 through 18. Paul is recounting his conversion experience here. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But arise, stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you. For what purpose? Look, verse 18, listen to this. To open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to what? Light. And from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. My friend, when it comes to the matter of Christian fellowship, a person has to be genuinely born again. Be a person by your speech, your actions, the way you respond, that brings light and not darkness. So... The benefits of participation in the local church, number one, instruction. Number two, fellowship. Number three, observance of the ordinances. See, we only have two. You got the Lord's Supper. That's the breaking of bread. What does that do? That reminds us of Jesus' death on the cross, his broken body for us. His broken body is the broken bread and his shed blood. That's the cup. That's the blood, the shedding of blood. And then we have baptism. But when a person comes in here and they they get baptized, this is their first sermon that they'll ever preach. The first one, what they're saying is this, I've been crucified with Christ, buried with Him, and raised with Him. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. The old things for me have passed away. Behold, new things have come. In other words, this is picture of a person coming from death to life with a big L, eternal life. This is a picture of a person coming out of Satan's kingdom into Christ's kingdom. No longer a child of Satan, but a child of God. And they are to walk as children of light. And you will have fellowship with one another. And so we observe the two ordinances at the local church. How are you going to do that uh, if you just hang out and watch television every Sunday? So the benefits of participation in the local church, we observe the ordinances of the breaking of the bread, and a baptism. Fourth benefit of participation in the local church is corporate prayer. Look again at uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 42. He says, um, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread. And notice, it says, and in prayers. You know why this is so important? Because when you pray together, what we're doing when we're praying, we're praying to God the Father, and we're praying through the merits of the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. The only way we can pray to God the Father is through the merits of His Son who died for us and has us on the cross, and we pray by the Holy Spirit who lives in us. He helps us to pray. We have Jesus, our advocate. He's our intercessor. And we also have an intercessor in the heart who is the Holy Spirit. And so when we pray together, you know what that is? We pray by the power of the Holy Spirit and we have his mind. And if I'm praying that way, 
If you're praying that way, if we're praying together and you're praying together with the mind of Christ by the Holy Spirit, you know what that makes us, don't you? Like-minded. It makes us like-minded. And so when we come together in the local church, there uh, is corporate prayer. And we should be praying for our city, our state, our nation, our world, and of course, our families. Another benefit of uh, participation in the local church is, number five, effective outreach. Look again at uh, verse 43 of uh, Acts chapter 2. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. You know what was happening? Was this. The folks were seeing what was happening, and the people were in awe. When people are in awe, they begin to share what they're in awe about. You begin to encourage other individuals with your faith. And so, look at uh, Acts chapter 4, verses 13 and uh, 20. Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Now, when they saw, listen, the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. They were in awe. And they realized that they had what? Been with who? Jesus. When you go to the local church, my friend, and you participate, and you walk in the Spirit, and you encourage others, they encourage you. You exercise your spiritual gift. My friend, things begin to happen. The place is elevated because you're here, and He's in you. There is a quantania, a fellowship that happens among God's people that you can't explain. You just are in awe of it. Christian fellowship. Look at verse 20 of Acts chapter uh, 4. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. You know what? You could save a lot of ink and a lot of paper and a lot of advertisement in the local church if people would just let Jesus be Jesus in them. I'm telling you, people hear and people are drawn to the awesomeness, the awe of it all. There's less darkness, there's more light. There's genuine fellowship and people are drawn to it. There is relationships that happen. Things happen relationally that you can't explain. It's just God at work. Nobody can say I did it. To say that would be arrogant Prideful, as far as I'm concerned, satanic. It's a God thing, His Word and His Spirit. And so, a benefit of participation in the local church is effective outreach. And then, a sixth reason we benefit is a common cause. Notice in verse 44 of Acts 2, they had all things in common. There was a sense of a team spirit. There was a sense of We're in this together. A common cause. They had all things in common. Seventh and last thing, mutual assistance. Look at verse 45 of Acts chapter 2. Back up to verse 44. Now all who believed were together. They had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. Mutual assistance. They were sharing with one another, basically, their substance. Now, you say, well, Chris, uh, that's going to be good for some and not for the rest, because some have more than others. Uh, This has to be done in a very wise, spiritual way. You can't let members, children of God, get into unhealthy relationships where they could be taken advantage of. We have everything in common. Sometimes we help people find jobs. Sometimes we help people find houses. Sometimes we help people sell houses. We connect people. We ought to think that way and just be that way without having to be told to. This is how we ought to operate as spirit-filled believers. You've been listening to Abiding Above Ministries with Chris Hodges. If you would like Chris to speak at your church or event, please go to our website, abidingabove.org. God bless you and make you a blessing.